Hello, good afternoon, and welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us at the SL10B uh, Community Celebrations. Um, I'm here with two very brilliant people who are, um, I suppose we could say central characters is the very least we could say, in the remarkable um, series which I follow avidly, um, The Blackened Mirror. And uh, we actually have with us, therefore, on the one hand, on my left, actually, let me start the right way around. On my right, Ashling Sinclair, um, who plays the part of Alice Allen. Um, her background's really interesting, and I didn't actually know any of this, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, kn I knew you'd been in the uh, in the media industry in in your life. In yes. The world, but um, after a career behind the camera, primarily as a writer and producer, and she's of course our, our um, director and producer on uh, Designing Worlds as well. Ashling, known to her friends as Ash, is learning the joys of working in front of the camera as Alice Allen. Um, she also played Miss Annabella Scott in the webcomic Quest for the Golden Prim, or as I tend to call it, the Quest for the Golden Prim. <laughs> That's right, you do. The Quest for the Golden Prim. Ooh. It's rather what it should be. Uh, only one of those joys is vindication for all the great period outfits in her inventory purchased because she really might be able to use it one day. Uh, another delight is the chameleon-like aspect of Second Life that allows her to play everything from a Maori warrior to a thieving nun on a bicycle. Uh, that's a very, very deep reference that only hardened Designing Worlds um, viewers specializing in our special new Babbage uh, editions will actually grasp. Uh, Variety is also the key to the rest of Ash's Second Life pursuits. She's advertising and client relations manager for Prim Perfect magazine, directs the Designing World's television program, and owns Miscellany, a home furnishings shop. So, welcome, Ash. Thank you very and much. I do keep busy. You certainly do. And we're all busy crowd. Mm. And on my left, uh, I don't know whether to call him Xander Green or... Scott Simpson. <laughs> but either, either one works just fine. <laughs> in either sense, he's a member of the Screen Actors Guild in the States, and he's appeared in more than a dozen feature films and TV episodes, in addition to over a hundred plays. And as a voice actor, he's worked in animation, gaming, and radio drama. And uh, he and I share a, a deep love of, of radio and radio drama as a medium, and uh, and voice work and stuff like that. Uh, among his favorite film projects, it says here, are Timepiece, working with James Earl Jones and Ellen Burstyn. That must have been really cool. Uh, extraordinary experience. Really, wow. Truly extraordinary. Uh, the HBO original film Ambushed, directed by Ernest Dickerson, and the pilot for Nathan Dixon, directed by Michael Apted. There's an interesting person to work with. Very interesting man. Fascinating guy. Favorite stage roles, it says here, include chorus in Henry V and the title role in Richard III. My God, I should, I should bow. <laughs> for, uh, I'll, I'll limp if, if you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, the title role in Richard III for uh, New York City's Looking Glass Theatre. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty neat place as well, as well as Vanek in Audience as part of New York's 2006 Vaclav Havel Festival. That must have been a neat thing to do. He just passed away uh, just this uh, yeah. couple, last couple of years. So, incredible man and certainly one of the most important voices of contemporary theater uh, globally. In Second Life, Scott or Xander, whichever we may call him, works as an educational and non-profit environment developer for organizations including, of course, the American Cancer Society and Valdosta State University. He's a co-founder of the Fantasy Fair of Second Life, a nine-sim annual Relay for Life event which has raised over 100,000 US dollars for the fight against cancer in the last four years. Welcome, Scott. Zan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elric. Maybe today. <laughs> um, now, we're actually here to... Um, talk about aspects of the Black and Mirror TV series and it's, um, it's really quite intriguing because um, the theme of SL10B 
is looking forward and looking back. And those ideas have a quite distinct relevance to aspects of Black and Mirror as well, don't they? Now, why don't we start by giving our audience a little bit of background about Black and Mirror? I, I, we can't tell, obviously, how much they know or don't know about, uh, about the show. And, uh, and, of course, we are being broadcast as well, so there will be people who may not have encountered the series at all. So perhaps you would like to give us an introduction. Um, Xander, how about, uh, how about you picking that one up? Uh, the Blackened Mirror is an original uh, dramatic series that's being uh, filmed entirely utilizing Second Life as uh, essentially a virtual location, a virtual soundstage. Um, we uh, use the avatars, obviously, uh, and um, have had great um, fun working uh, on a lot of wonderful sims across Second Life, uh, including uh, Seraph City, sort of a diesel punk sim, Pumpkin Trips' is sim. It's an incredible environment to get to go and work in, uh, very immersive. Uh, certainly, a uh, very important sim for us was uh, the Innsmouth sim, a recreation of uh, some of the uh, most important locations in the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, the series itself draws um, from those two different sims. You kind of get a sense, I think, of, of what the series um, draws its inspiration from. Obviously, it's uh, very much the hard-boiled detective uh, in a kind of film noir cinematic style uh, that uh, you know, the outsider, lonely, hard-drinking, hard-fighting, um, world-weary uh, detective who uh, sees the ugly underside of the world and has a dark and mysterious past. And we should uh, actually interject at this point because I neglected to uh, mention it in the intro. Uh, that man is Harland Quinn and right. that man is played by yourself. Yes, yeah, uh, it's a great character. Um, it uh, brings in all of the best of those uh, detective characters uh, along with, because the, the show is really such a genre bender, and it starts off as a hard-boiled detective, but um, it quickly evolves into high adventure along the lines of Lost Horizon, uh, and um, evolves ultimately into Lovecraftian horror images and uh, elements from H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's um, early 20th century American horror writer uh, from his work. Uh, and um, so the character gets to kind of go on that journey as well. As, as the show morphs in its uh, style and in the genres it's specifically referencing, uh, the characters uh, kind of begin to reflect those different values from those different genres as well. Uh, there are six episodes currently, and of course you can access them via the web at uh, theblackendmirror.com. And uh, e the games aspect of it has been um, suspended now for those six episodes, but uh, as we get ready to work on our second season, another set of six episodes, uh, new games and interactive hunts and challenges will be uh, incorporated as part of this. So people can watch the show uh, and then follow the clues that they see on screen, and that will lead them to locations and destinations in Second Life. And uh, perhaps you can find uh, sometimes prizes. Other times, the prize is an insight into character or into a you know a character's backstory or a, a little hint as to perhaps where things are uh, about to to head uh, by interacting with the sets and the locations themselves. So it's utilizing the best I think of this virtual world, this astonishing virtual platform, to both create an interactive. RPG element, but also to use it in a more traditional sense to create programming and, and to tell stories. And of course, that's what um, Ash and I both come from a background in a variety of different uh, mediums doing just that. Um, hers more journalistic, mine more on the um, artistic side, but uh, in essence, both uh, primarily concerned with telling stories. And uh, mm. to come in and get to use this astonishing virtual platform to further those ends is something that I just feel very fortunate to, you know, to be able to say you've gotten to be a part of. Yeah, and, and it's a very impressive uh, melange as well. It's, it's so multidimensional, basically. Um, it's, uh, I, and I was thinking, well, yeah, what would I call this? And, and at some level, it, you might call it fantasy noir or something like that. Yeah, but I think so. It's, mm -hmm. it's so multidimensional because there's all these other elements. There's the virtual world aspect. There's the um, different strands that are pulled together. There's the interactivity, um, the games that are hung off it and stuff like that. Now, mm -hmm. I, uh, turning to Ash now, um, perhaps you could give us a little bit of an introduction to your character. Uh, well, Ash. my character is, you know, every... Um, 
film noir story has to have a woman of mystery. And uh, Alice Allen, my character, is that woman of mystery. She comes to see Mr. Quinn um, because she has, she's having trouble getting home. And there's an object that she needs to acquire in order to get home. Now, no one knows really how this object gets her home. It's, it's a crystal disc. We don't disc. even know what it is, do we? No, uh, well, we do know. It's, we it's do a crystal know. disc. Uh, and uh, how does a crystal disc get someone home? Well, we don't really know that. I think we don't know that to this day. And we don't um, know why it would be there or that's where, right. where it would be or why. That's right. That's right. So she, she is largely still a question mark, but uh, in terms of her character, well, that is, that is developing, has developed over the series of six. Um, you know, she's essentially, uh, she's very bright, uh, she's good-hearted, um, she has a very faithful retainer in, uh, in Mr. Biggins, who is a man who she has met on her travels. Um, I will perhaps say that it wasn't entirely her idea to leave home altogether. Uh, mm. So, uh, mm. Mm. so she's trying to get so back to where she belongs. Here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only clue ah. I'm going to give you. Little, little additional snippets of information that we have not been party to previously. Right, mm. right. But uh, she's uh, she's a good woman, um, very bright, uh, very driven. And uh, she needs Mr. Quinn in order uh, to further her agenda. But uh, all, all in all, I think it's probably not a bad agenda. But she does have uh, she does have her moments. She sometimes does not mess around. Mm. And of course, I appreciate that that about her. Well, you probably would, wouldn't you? Not being mm. one to mess around yourself. <laughs> 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 Shh, hush. <laughs> <laughs> such, a, such a wonderful thing in a professional environment. <laughs> now, uh, in fact, one of the really, um, well, this, this ties into so many different things, but, but one of the things that really, uh, really stands out in the series for me is the very um, complex, sophisticated, um, deep, um, nature of the relationship between the two characters as it develops through the through the episodes that we've seen so far, um, it's it's actually a very um, it's it's got a lot of dimension to it, doesn't it? Yes, and uh, of course that is largely due to our wonderful writer David Abbott, who well, I was about to come on to him actually. Yeah. Yes, and perhaps um, really um, the key to anything. Um, working like this is actually having a good script, isn't it? Oh, at the end of the day. Definitely. absolutely, definitely. And and what you have is a really truly remarkable script, actually, and a remarkable scriptwriter. So perhaps we we could uh, talk about uh, Mr. Abbott a little. Well, he is a professional scriptwriter. Um, he's done some some wonderful work, and certainly has on our series. Um, he himself is a bit of a man of mystery. Uh, <laughs> And he likes it that way. So yes, I'm sure he does. Yeah, yeah. But um, well, why why don't we look into this relationship between your two characters for a moment um, that uh, that David has given you? It's it's really not totally straightforward, is it? No. Um, as I said, Alice is looking at Quinn. Well, at least initially, as a means to an end, and uh, she is not altogether upfront with him because. No, I think she operates to some extent on a need-to-know basis. And there, frankly, are some things she's confused about herself. So uh, she uh, doesn't look at him as initially as someone whom she really needs to take care of. Um, but I think that may be changing over time. Hmm, well, that's interesting. And uh, Xander, from your point of view, one gets the impression that uh, Quinn thinks of... Um, Alice as being a bit of a pain. <laughs> I, I think Quinn regards, it's nothing personal, I think he regards pretty much everyone and everything as a pain. Uh, uh, he's uh, got uh, quite a chip on his shoulder about, um, well, who, who knows what specifically at this point. Actually, people who have um, followed all of the games in world throughout the first six episodes uh, have a much better idea of some of those things and those games being largely closed 
Um, maybe we can divulge some of that uh, well, here, perhaps can, for yes. the first time, actually, because it is... we might give people a little bit of uh, insights for ready for the next series. Yeah, yeah. Well, like uh, like Alice, uh, Quinn is a bit of a stranger in the strange land. He's not from. We encounter him in Seraph City. That's where his private detective uh, office is. He's clearly an element of the community and has been for some time. But um, it's made clear through the evidence that's uncovered by the process of going through the various interactions of games that uh, he is not from Seraph City. Uh, where exactly he's from remains a mystery up until the um, finale moment of the, of the first season, the end of the sixth episode, wherein uh, he has finally brought uh, Biggins and, and Alice uh, to where he believes uh, the source of this, um, this um, adversity that's being thrown at them collectively. Uh, he, he thinks he knows where it's coming from and uh, he leads them um, from wherever Seraph City, the fictional um, LA-like, you know, very um, steampunk element, a diesel punk element rather, um, but um, also just a real strong deco, you know, uh, a vibe there as well. So uh, there's a feeling that that's generally somewhere, I think, on the western, west coast of the U.S., but um, Quinn uh, brings them back to the other side of the United States, back east into Lovecraft country, and they uh, land in the uh, in the city of uh, Innsmouth, a location that would be familiar to any real H.P. Lovecraft fan. And um, it's made clear by the end of the episode that this is in fact where Quinn is from. This is home. Um, other elements that come up over the course of the hunts is that you find out that um, there was um, much earlier in his life, as a fairly young man uh, from Innsmouth, he fell in love with a woman there. Um, they were sort of um, mismatched socially. She was very high society, he was very low. Um, but they fell in love working together uh, as actors on a production of Romeo and Juliet. And um, you find newspaper clippings, uh, articles about them and uh, the, about the play, a poster uh, from the show. Um, you discover later on that, um, for reasons unknown, Quinn has had to leave Innsmouth uh, writes a very painful letter to uh, this woman, Mary, um, and um, leaves Innsmouth. Then you find in newspaper clippings that is some years later that speaks of a fire uh, at uh, Arkham Asylum, nearby Arkham Asylum, uh, and uh, that uh, a patient there, Mary Haskell, uh, has perished in the fire, and that another patient is missing after that. And this coincides with um, Quinn's disappearance and then sudden reappearance in uh, Seraph City uh, sometime later. So you, you had a little uh, bit more of the backstory there throughout those elements, and it the, paints the picture of a man who has loved and, and lost and, uh, you know, is in, in many ways broken. And uh, So you can understand why he's living inside his whiskey bottle, kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearly he's brushed up against not only some fairly nefarious characters, but, you know, some fairly diabolical uh, literally diabolical uh, elements as well as this Lovecraftian horror element begins to rear its um, ugly, slimy, slopey head. Um, <laughs> Green <laughs> tentacly <laughs> head. Yes. Yes. Tentacles. You, you do get the Tentacles. Feeling that, uh, yes. Something has happened that has uh, corrupted his soul, in a sense, and that this uh, climbing inside the bottle, I think, is an attempt to make the outward man he wants the outward man to resemble, you know, the inward man. So he's, you know, he believes himself to be a um, uh, broken and kind of beyond redemption figure. But uh, and for her part, for her part, Alice has had some brushes with, with uh, some rather serious characters herself in in her travels, in her attempts to get home. And as the series progresses, she under she begins to understand that she and Quinn have far more in common than she ever thought. Yeah, they, more than they are aware of, they, they find that this, uh, con this connection to these really dark, um, other p worldly powerful entities, um, it, it, that that is a bond that they share. They don't realize that there's a pivotal moment in the fifth episode where suddenly both of them get it in that moment. Uh, you, know, you do know what we're actually dealing with here and, and the recognition that the other one does as well. So that moment passes between them in, uh, in a kind right. of... Uh, uh, interesting uh, betrayal uh, there that Quinn realizes, um, you know, he's thinking all along, she doesn't know what she's gotten all of us into, and then he realizes, you know, in fact, she does, she does know. So, she knows only too well, in fact. She know. does, indeed, yeah, yeah, and that's, we uh, don't that's actually, we, deepening we don't of her character. Know where, we don't actually know where Alice is from, do we? 
London. She does say she's from London. Now the oh, question is, okay. when is she from? When? Probably oh, more yes. than which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which which London and when? Which when? Yes. Yes. So. Yes. She does appear on the scene wearing Victorian clothing, and uh, you know it could be simply because she feels comfortable in Victorian clothing, and it could be something else. Well, That's she still yeah. to be determined. She's at least 50, 60 years out of sync with uh, the contemporary exactly. uh, world of Seraph City that she I, I must into. say that I've, I've certainly, um, you know, I noted that uh, discrepancy very early on. I'm thinking, hmm, and, you know, what sort of, do we have a, um, a single alternative universe thing happening here? Yeah. Um, or do we actually have multiple... Um, timelines overlaid on each other or something like that. I mean, who or could, could she be a time traveler who well, exactly, uh, chose yeah. the nearest available period for her wardrobe? You know, hard to say. Yep, and so. that mystery deepens in that final moment of the sixth uh, of the finale of season one when uh, the, the stranger walks in on them and uh, the camera first notes um, the, the hero's reaction to seeing this, this dark shadowy figure and then the camera turns around and we see that uh, the dark shadowy figure is a seeming carbon copy of Harland Quinn, a better dressed, more put together and clearly less uh, uh, affected by uh, hard living, but uh, nonetheless a, a, a seeming clone of, of Harland Quinn himself that they're face to face with. And uh, clearly Quinn is just as um, shocked by this as, as Alice or, or anyone is. So um, that, that question of uh, <laughs> are we dealing with alternate realities, are we talking about timelines here, are we talking about uh, something else altogether? Um, it was a um, uh, twin brother, as uh, Cinder raises the possibility of, mm -hmm. uh, as well. Could be. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, at this point, uh, we have yeah, a lot we, it, There's a lot that we don't know, because uh, our writer, right. David Abbott, being such a man of mystery, does not like discussing things like this with his actors more than we need to know to do our that's, roles properly, which is which is that we fun appreciate, us. too. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. That's not a complaint. It's a lot of fun that way. Yeah, it's nice not to have to act like you don't know information that your character doesn't know. You know? <laughs> That's right, uh, sure. Um, I, the, Safia Widdershins has been directing these episodes, and uh, she and uh, David have such a, a, a great idea for each for each episode you know i mean david brings us these incredible scripts they're short uh, less than 10 minutes each episode and he packs you know a, a full beginning middle and end an incomplete mm -hmm. arc you know into each yeah. episode and uh the the way the two of them evolved over the course of these episodes to create in essence uh, a storyboarding process where each episode is uh, blocked out in essence in 2d uh, as we get ready to think about how to make it uh, you know, get it get it actually filmed in 3d so um, it's been a really interesting process to watch them invent new protocols and adapt old ideas uh, to this new uh, platform. It's been a fascinating process to watch the director and uh, writer, in this case, uh, yeah. work together on this. I mean, uh, I, we've said that uh, all of us have a background in media in some form or fashion, and uh, you know, so, so we sort of know how things go, but there really is no one to teach us how to do these particular things that we do because we are in such a new platform and uh, our workflow is different. You know, we're all over the globe. Um, collaboration is is always interesting. You know, A, we're in Second Life, which, you know, has its own problems and, you know, B, we have uh, time zones. Uh, there's so many issues that we have to overcome. Uh, you know, controlling the avatars, puppeting the avatars, uh, and trying to get uh, the appropriate uh, expression, um, you know, essentially the basics of acting, isn't always easy. It's easier um, perhaps in real life than it is here because, you know, one has a real face, one has a real body that we can, we can move at will in the real world. Here we have to have really good animation and... Uh, we have to take care. Uh, we, we've worked very hard on facial expressions. I, I think, as, as you all know, there's just a, a set range of facial expressions available to us, and most of them are a little bit exaggerated, and, and you wouldn't want to use them too often. So we have to uh, cut around that or you know, try whatever various techniques we can, we can manage to make all that work for us. It's been a lot of fun uh, investigating and exploring all of those things. Yeah, I can imagine it has. Um, I, I'd like to pick up this um, business of um, of the well. Is it time travel? Is it alternate universes? 
but is it also um, a, a confluence of genres as well? And there are all kinds of um, of elements in here, aren't there? There's there's things which are, well, obviously there's the the steampunk um, possibility in the background that that uh, Alice might conceivably bring with her, and um, certainly she's brought some unusual technology with her. Um, there's also the diesel punk setting of Seraph City. Um, and then also we have a very um, sort of good old 19th century Lovecraftian um, environment at Innsmouth as well. These yeah. things are all running into each other and, uh, and merging, intertwining, aren't they? It's really time-in-specific. Um, there are old things, there are new things, there are things that actually don't exist but could. Uh, the whole thing time-wise is, yeah, very much, as you say, very much uh, a melange. And uh, we find that very fun and very, very interesting to work with. This is another way that this connects to the, the looking forward and looking back theme for this uh the celebration, this community celebration here for 10 years of SL, I think, too. It's each one of these genres, in a sense, uh, steampunk that draws so much from the Vernian aesthetic, you know, and, and really that's a kind of retro-futurist aesthetic. It's it's the, mm. the past's yeah. idea of what the future would look like, and, uh, you know, it, you kind of flip that when you go to the Lovecraft then, because here you have a writer who was, you know, for all practical purposes, living in our modern world, but he was clearly longing for an older world style and for the mm the loss of a formality and uh, a, a kind of high cultural form that he, you know, thought so so much of, whether it be, you know, Poe or Lord Dunsany or, you know, there's just so much of that old world that was falling away and Lovecraft was, I think, mourning and lamenting the loss of some of that. And so, it, in a sense, there's the future looking nostalgically back in the past, whereas Verne is looking forward optimistically and uh, I think you could say realistically into the future as well. So that sense of, you know, being on the one side and looking either forward or back, uh, the idea of uh, the wormholes that the Black and Mirror itself clearly, you know, opens up. They travel through all these different places by means of a conveyance through any kind of reflective surface. Ideally a mirror, although at one point Alice uh, improvises and pulls out a bottle of mercury and uh, uses a kind of a, mm -hmm. a, a, a pool of mercury in order to uh, do the, the use the same trick, although she implies that this is not uh, a very good idea, but she wouldn't be doing it if she had a choice. But uh, uh, so this idea of jumping from one point of uh, reference in time to another uh, is very much a part of the story, and in fact, it speaks right to the title of the show itself. Right, and it's a, and it's also a very very um, ingenious uh, device in the in all senses of the word. Um, it's it's actually you know everything, uh, every sort of sci-fi stroke whatever um, tale has some sort of um, innovative or different or previously unknown um, technology or or capability in it. Yeah. A lot of the time, what we're doing with um, science fiction in many ways is uh, looking at how ordinary people respond to extraordinary situations, aren't we? And in horror exactly. as well. Um, you know, that's uh, yeah. certainly is a strong element of horror as well. And uh, um, I, I think that was, if there's any H.P. Lovecraft devotees in the house, I'll apologize. But, you know, I, I think you, you would agree that many people would argue he's not as great a writer as he is a thinker, that, that, that it's not so much the, you know, the, the words on the printed page uh, that are historically so important with regards to his work. It's, it's the influence that he's had in the f informing the ideas, not only in, in horror, but also in science fiction as well. And mm. really, really what he did was despiritualize horror in a way. He said you don't need ghosts and, you know, the undead in order to, you know, have something that terrifies a modern mind. There's, in an infinite, big enough universe, there's bound to be something out there that's... There are always <laughs> tentacles. <laughs> <and neither. laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> tentacles. <laughs> uh, so. I find it so it. ironic, you know, if, if he was longing for the past, that he looked into the past and he found tentacles. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and of course, all of that is a, a kind of a reference to a xenophobia that, that he was plagued with. It, it, one 
one could argue it seems that he kind of gets over that in the latter part of his life, but certainly through a lot of his life, he was um, extremely anti-immigrant, um, just really didn't hold his tongue on those subjects uh, very much at all in his correspondence and letters. He's, uh, he very much reflects a kind of um, frightened, paranoid mindset of uh, America at that time. Uh, it was not, not unique to him, but uh, he was very... Um, he was uh, very nativist. Yes, very much so. Very much so. And, and again, seems to have kind of made peace with that as he got older and um, reconciled uh, himself to a new America that was much more uh, pluralistic. But uh, clearly, it really <laughs> source of great anxiety for him. And, um, and so and this is another reason why he's, he's casting his eye backwards so wistfully at a, um, you know, a past that had time to languish in pur purple prose and <laughs> lengthy poetry. Right. Yeah. And in a sense, also, and, and not only is he looking back, um, when we look at the black and mirror, we are looking back as well, aren't we? All, sure. all of the periods that are of or genres rolling into periods, the periods in which genres are generally placed, uh, are all in the past as well. There is, there's no, certainly not at this point anyway, uh, who knows what might come in the future, but, but there's nothing futuristic here. They're all retrospective. Absolutely. Um, well, yes, except, um, you know, we, the, one of the places that they go, uh, which is an island um, full of spiritual people, uh, one of whom is the abbess is a mentor of Alice's. We don't really know when that is. You know, we, it could be in the past, could well be, could be in the present, could be in the future. It's a very timeless place. Well, I was going to say, it could be out of time altogether, mm, as we know mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could well be. Mm. So uh, there is that kind of temporal mystery too. Now this also keys into the fascinating combination of uh, techniques and technologies and capabilities that actually make it possible to make the black and mirror at all, don't they? Well, yes. Uh, I touched on that a little bit before. And the fact that we're doing all of this looking back through time, um, predominantly back through time, and using these very futuristic method methods, uh, you know, very cutting-edge methods today uh, that we're having to teach ourselves, I think that's uh, a great juxtaposition. And in a sense, going back to some of the oldest forms, uh, really the... The work we do in world is essentially just digital puppetry, um, <laughs> and uh, we add to that uh, really just uh, fairly straightforward radio drama, you know, audio uh, drama production. Uh, it's voice acting meets a kind of a digital form of puppetry. So. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of hearkening back as well to uh, er, really very old forms of storytelling um, and um, utilizing this, this uh, new platform to explore um, some of these oldest of, uh, of mediums and forms of storytelling in general and of, uh, and of character creation. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting contrast, a cutting edge platform, and yet what we're doing is getting back to basics, I think, in a lot of ways as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, just uh, stripping it of everything except uh, uh, the the connection between the characters and the unfolding of the story itself. Well, it's mm -hmm. certainly very interesting um, to make that um, connection between uh, the audio side being more like radio drama, but coupled with um, a puppetry style, um, conceptual anyway style. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the visuals, it's really quite an interesting observation, that one. And, and the more I think about it, the more sensible it is. And I, I've often uh, likened the sort of television that we do I with something like Designing Worlds as being very much like television was in the 1950s, where it was all very live. And even if it was recorded, it was recorded as live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you, you went and did it and... Uh, um, and at least we can edit now. In the in the earlier yes. days, in the earlier days of designing worlds and meta makeover before it, we could, we didn't have editing because it was going out live as it happened. At least we can edit things now. So we we've kind of moved into the uh, into the sixties or something, I suppose. Um, but um, but certainly the the 
there, there's an interesting um, area in which um, the amount of sort of, well, I suppose we could call it bandwidth in a sense, is actually available to communicating um, imagination. Uh, is that depending on how much you have, you use it in different ways. So, uh, for example, if you're reading a book, the bandwidth is extremely low. All the construction is done in your head. With radio drama, um, you've got the sound effects, you've possibly got stereo position, you've got um, the sound of the voices. Um, but you are still doing all the real work um, in terms of imagining the scene and what have you. And, and the old cliche is that uh, radio drama is, is such a wonderful medium because the pictures are so much better. And that's mm -hmm. because our imaginations are so good at doing that. Mm -hmm. At the other end of the scale, if you're doing um, Star Wars, let's say, absolutely every last bit has to be given to you. All the things that your imagination would normally generate for you have to be provided. It seems to me that, that um, with something like the Black and Mirror, it's operating in a space between the two. Certain things on the visual front are given. They're provided for you. But there is actually still a, um, a visual suspension of disbelief, in a sense, where, where you actually um, kind of make allowances for things in the way that you do in any form of animation, for example. That you, you accept the convention that it... Uh, that it's depicted in. Um, whereas on the audio front, um, you are doing as much as you possibly can to let people's imagination fill in the visual gaps as well. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You know, you were, you were mentioning um, ancient techniques, and I think this goes all the way back to Greek theater, which was uh, very stylized, um, using masks, which couldn't, I mean, obviously, your face can't move when you're, when you're wearing a mask, so you have to depend on voice and gesture and uh, a lot of the things that we depend on here. So it does have that um, very, very old heritage mm. uh, within well, a very a really, new framework. That's an extremely astute observation, I think, actually. That's really quite spot on. Yeah. Mm. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, we're, unfortunately, we did start a little bit late, but I wouldn't like to hold up our um, next talk. So uh, we have a few minutes left before the top of the hour, and I wonder if um, anybody has any questions in the audience. And if you have, if you could stick them in um, nearby chat so we can see them. Then, um, and I'll ask you guys to uh, to pick the question straight up if you wish. If we have any uh, comments from the audience, I'll, I'll, I'll find we should read them out so that uh, it gets captured for the video. But um, if anybody's got any uh, questions, no. Nope. No. Evidently not. Okay. <laughs> but um, well, oh, I see Cinder's typing. Aha. <laughs> okay. Oh, that work ever have? Ooh, now there's a question. There's a question. That's <laughs> interesting. I haven't been asked. A <laughs> villain. Thank you so much for your confidence. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't actually Wouldn't been that asked. Would be this, fun? Um, it would be. It would be great fun. Uh, uh, the real question is: um, is uh, you know, can, do I get some time off from um, editing Designing Worlds to do oh. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to plan for that. <laughs> um, that, that could be immense fun. Um, I, I just, well, it's true. Yes, it is. Bad guys get some of the juices lines. Yes, indeed they do. Um, well, I it's... Bet Elric can I, twirl a mustache with the best of them. Aha, uh -huh, given a good animation, I can do anything you like. <laughs> um, but, uh, in fact... It must be said, I, and I, I regard um, Black and Mirror as being a really uh, remarkable confluence of many brilliant talents, um, which give the whole production at every level, every aspect of the production, um, an extremely high set of production values. And uh, as a result, if somebody asked me if I'd like to, uh, I'd like to play some, you know, help part, however tiny. Um, it would be an honor because being involved in something as high quality as that is, uh, you know, I really like high quality things. The real question is whether it's actually practical. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I think we'd be delighted to have you. And thank you for those kind words. And thank you, too, Cinders, for yours. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ashling Sinclair and Xander Green, Scott Simpson. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you both for coming today. And uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. And I hope uh, that our listeners and viewers have enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.